Welcome to Word in Your Ear. This is just one of the things we do. If you want to help us keep doing them, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. You won't regret it. Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic. And, uh, and uh, I was reminded the other day uh, of our of our guest today by a social media traffic that but was reminiscing about the days when I was at Smash Hits and I used to act as Cupid or attempted Cupid between <laughs> a variety of up and coming pop stars, most of whom wanted to have a date with Claire Grogan. I don't know if they're all successful, but one of the applicants is our guest today. Bobby Bluebell. Bobby, hey. welcome. How are you Hi, doing? Hey, guys. I'm very good, thank you. Good to see you. Where are you, Bobby? I'm, I'm in my house in uh, Glasgow's West End. Right, right. And uh, as is customary on these chats, what we normally do is we ask people if they can remember what was the record-playing machinery in their home when they were a child. It's a way of trying to get, it, trying to find out about people's uh, home lives. But go on, what can you remember? What it was? Well, we we quite my brothers were very into records. They had quite advanced stereos at the, at the time. You know, uh, units. You know, you had you had the tuner and then the tape deck and then the, the amplifier. The oh yeah, player. Do you know what I mean? So like, uh, I think he still got that. So I, I've just changed my system back to kind of like an old fashioned Sony system. Uh, all, all very analog, and I'm really enjoying it at the moment. You know, right? But so what were you? But can you remember the records that were playing in the in in the family home? Yeah, well, we we had an Italian family. My mum was Italian, and and uh, we we spent a lot of time in Italy. And when we were there, we were given these little kind of like hamburger record players. You know, the ones you just slip the record inside. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Right at the beach. So I fell in love with Italian records. I've got one here actually. It's um, Drupi's um, Vadovia. Which I would say is probably one of the greatest records ever made. Sorry, who was the artist? Who's it by? Who's the artist? Rupi. D R U P I. Oh, Droopy. Droopy, yeah. I need subtitles from my accent. But um, this was a big record in Italy. I mean, this is this brings back me and my brothers sitting on the beach in Pescara, you know, in the sixties, listening to these on our, on our individual um, little. Um, Hamburger record players are very big in Italy, little sandwich ones that you can yes, Yeah, I, I remember can, them. I can kind of, kind of yeah, remember. Yeah. So you were kind of Glasgow Italian, or at least That's half good. half yes. Glasgow Italian. Do you speak? Yeah. Did you speak any Italian? Avero, come on. <laughs> oh, really? Right. Well, the, I, I married an Italian for a while, and, and from the same village as, as my mum, and we had a daughter together. We used to go to Italy every year, you know, by train, a three day journey. Oh, really? Know, oh, that must be wonderful. Yeah. It, it was, but there's about 10 of us used to go all, all our... My, my, my mother's sister's married Scottish guys, you know, as well. So they, they all came over one by one. To It, it was like, gee, Tinder. It was called, like, it's like Italia. <laughs> we all married Scottish guys. And, and then um, it was a great time. It was a great, great time to be... to be. I remember being there in 66 when England won the World Cup. And the, the guy gave us Coca-Cola for nothing. And we were protesting because we were Scottish, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, he, was, he, was, he was trying to get you to celebrate, was he? He was, yeah. <laughs> As a misunderstanding. So no iron brew. That's right. Yeah. No iron brew. It was just, it was yeah. Pepsi, to be fair, actually. Pepsi seems to be big in Italy. Right, right. Can you remember where you bought records when you yeah, were a kid? Yeah, yeah, the first record I ever bought, I wish I had it here, actually. I got it in there. It was Mother of Mine by uh, Neil Reed. Oh, wow. I bought it for my mum for a birthday. Oh. And, and guess what? I, I walked to, I was probably about 10, I walked to town and, and then I, I, the money I had, I bought Rocket Man at the same time by Elton John, you know, right? And it was a little gatefold sleeve. Yeah. And when I got home with that, I remember thinking, this is the most fantastic thing I've ever seen in my whole life. I mean, it wasn't so much the record, which I do love, but it was the sleeve, you know, like, like yeah. I, I never had anything that pretty, you know? So Neil Reed, mother of mine, was he? Yeah. Did he win a talent contest? Yeah, he was winning in Ox, Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, he, it was kind of small boy singing a, devo- a song of devotion to his mother. That was yeah, number one in the charts, which was a big thing in Scotland. It was, it was like um, 
Again, there wasn't many, many Scottish number ones, I think. Oh, so he was Scottish, was he? Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So when did you first start buying LPs and so forth? Or was that a long time later? Yeah, well, the first one I remember buying with my own money, I think, was the Moody Blues, every every good boy deserves favour. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was because the cover was so so pretty. But then then I realised my brother already had it. So I took it back and swapped it for Split by Groundhogs. <laughs> oh, God, the Groundhogs again. It's funny yeah. how many times they come up. <laughs> oh, you got to remember in those days at school, people wore Air Force coats and kind oh, of yeah. you know, like, like badge of honour, you know? Absolutely. Mostly, mostly Zeppelin, because we carried around T-Rex records, so we were kind of like the, the effect, the effect yeah. of the school, man, you know? So you did actually carry around records. We've talked about that a lot. That was just a real sort of identity badge, wasn't it? You would actually not that you were going to play them anywhere, but you would just carry record sleeves around with you. Yeah, you? but you know, the strange thing I can remember about school is we used to sit in people's houses, like six of us, with headphones on and listen to "In Rock" by Deep Purple, with all with headphones on. Can you imagine? I mean, like it's a silent disco, only silent <laughs> dog. <laughs> and, and what a bonding experience that is if you, if you come right down to it you know like I used to we used to try and fry bananas in the frying pan and kid on it was it was it was a um, dope you know what I mean these are the things that 11 year old boys are going to do isn't it you know <laughs> it is but it was there was a time and it was quite a long period of time well, you used to just go and visit people because they had records. Correct. It was the only and way you get to hear them, wasn't it? And that's how you became friends. David, you you, made, you swapped records and you, and sometimes you got them back, but sometimes you didn't want them back because if you had, like, say, every, every good picture tells a story, you know, with the sort of splits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you, I'm keeping that, you know what I mean? You know, because you didn't want... I mean, there was, was never a dull moment, sorry. You didn't want to give that back because you had a single sleeve version of it, you know. You wanted to keep, keep the... Uh, I used to love sleeves. I used to collect sleeves. I remember family had great sleeves. They yeah. did, oh, yeah. You know, like they, they all had sleeves that were that were designed by. by I mean, Alice Cooper one. I mean, I've got his cup here. School's out. I've still got the panties on my record. You know. Oh, have you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they made it to a wee desk. You know. I mean, genius behind these people. You know, Martin Hoople had a wee you know, black mask in it. You, you could you could wear. You know. So, I mean, it was all the, and the Mott Hoople Mott record had that plastic insert thing, you know, you can see. It did. It did. They, all, they all involved what, what I think nowadays we would call paper engineering, didn't they? That's correct, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a pink, there was a there was a Jethro Tull album called Stand Up. When you <laughs> opened it, the group popped up in, in a kind of uh, yeah. uh, and, illustration. It was fantastic. And Hot Wind as well. When it folded, yeah. This, and, and I remember Isaac Cades, I wish I bought this, it folded into a giant crucifix. Yes, you know? it did. Black like Moses. Black like Moses, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that was, you know, nobody made videos. No. And so that was just a huge visual experience, wasn't it? It was yes. buying the record, taking it home, and then getting it out for the first time, you know. Yeah, you, you used to have, you have unboxing videos now on YouTube. <laughs> In those days, it'd be unsleeving, you know. Yes, like, yes. The, the, the taking the cellophane off. off. <laughs> yeah, like, you know. And I'll, I remember, I've got, I've got one here I brought. This is one that I... This one made a huge impression on me. Uh, obviously, it's a white album, but I remember thinking, how generous this band are, you know, to give you all this stuff in, in a record, you know, like the... It the, came with a poster, didn't I mean, it? You've still, you still got Four it. pictures of the band. Stamped. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, lyric sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, stamped. You know, like, you know, didn't want to play it. It was like, it was just pure art, you know. I think it was Richard Hamilton that did this. It was, yeah. yeah. But I mean, what a piece! Of, what a piece of work! And and the same with this one. I've brought this other one to show you because I brought the wrong bill on the ground way back. I brought the one without banana. This is the one, you know, oh, with just, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. crappy British one. I found this in a in a market in Glasgow way back then. But I think that's a better sleeve to tell you the truth than the than the than the, than the, the omnipresent banana. But there you go. <laughs> Can you remember the first groups you saw? You remember the first band you ever saw play? Yeah, the, the, the first real concert I ever went to was, I don't want to mention them again, was Elton John at Kelvin Hall. Uh, but the first real band I saw was, was uh, Mott Hoople also, you know, and, and I think they, it was like, I, I saw bands, like school bands, you know, like we had GHD bands and and one of, one of Ms. Dewar's bands, I think they were called Slick, you know, they used to be called Salvation. They, they, oh, they, yeah, they, Ms. Dewar, yeah. There was a school circuit, believe it or not, in Glasgow then, where bands would come and play your Christmas dances and your and concerts and there was a lot of underage 
concerts, if you get my drift, but, yeah, but yeah. it wasn't until you went to a real concert with adults that you felt you were at a... A lot of those concerts were just basically fighting between gangs, you know? <laughs> so when you went we were to talking to Mitch Mar- the other day, weren't we, Dave? He was talking yeah, about he, Clouds well, Disco, wasn't yeah, he? Clouds, in Glasgow yeah. and in Edinburgh. And That's Salvation and Slick played there and, and Stumble and just played covers. Can you remember those? Yeah. Did you ever go to those? Yeah, well, I went to Clouds to see uh, Simple Minds. First time they were called Simple Minds. And funny enough, uh, Orange just were playing with them, but they were called New Sonics, though I didn't. I didn't see New Sonics playing. I just went to see Simple Minds and they were supporting them. Uh, uh, what was that? Uh, um, a reggae band, not Misty Roots. I can't remember anyway. One of those reggae bands were, they were supporting anyway. And uh, that was that was an experience, you know, because I used to go to club, I used to go to discos underage on my own. And it, Glasgow's quite a scary place, you know. I mean, it isn't so much now, but back then all the buses left George Square at the same time. So all the gangs would be each bus stop. You had to kind of negotiate your way home safely, oh, you know. We see, warning, going, I mean, even in the in the rest of the UK, yeah. going to gigs in the seventies and early eighties yeah. was a dangerous business. It was. We Fights went, were we very were, very common, weren't they? Well, we, we went to we went to it was Green's players at the time. We went. I mean, before punk, we saw everybody from from Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer. To, I mean, I, I mean, we read Bobby Gillespie's book. It's an, about the same year, me and Bobby are friends, and his book is so reminiscent of, of all our childhoods, you know, the, the queuing up for concerts. I remember queuing up to see the Stones at his um, Goat's Head suit, and that was great fun. That was, that was as much fun as the concert, you know. Really? Even even though you're out all night, because you, you're, you're a young boy, you mean, awake, no phones, your parents don't know where you are. We left straight from that queue and went straight to school, you know. So, <laughs> and then the concert... Was was just fantastic. Alice Cooper, one of the best concerts I've seen in my whole life. You know, even to this day, I don't know how he went from being hung to in a white suit singing "I Want to Be Elected" and a top hat on. Like an, it seemed to be like in a flash. So obviously there's some sort of dummy in the gallows, and then he was just. But it was like a magic trick, you know. And, yeah. and it was a really exciting record as well, you know. Yeah. So Mot the Hoople, go back to Mot the Hoople. What lineup of Mot the Hoople were you told? Did you oh, see? Oh, the, the original. I tell you, Mot the Hoople all, all over my storyline because um, when we did the Bluebells first session, it was Buffin was the engineer. Oh, and, really? Yeah, and, and Ken, the singer, he worked with Luther, Luther um, uh, Grosvenor, who became Ariel Bender. Yeah, of course. So, and and Mot the Hoople, I've got virtually every Mot the Hoople and Ian Hunter record you could get. I, for a long time, I assumed that Ian Hunter was Scottish because he lived... He was from Hamilton, but he was born in England. So was, I used to collect, I used to be so into Scottish bands, you know, like I would claim anybody, you know, as be anyone remotely Scot- Scottish. <laughs> really? Like, like who? What like, kind of people? Oh, he, Jeff Tall, you know what I mean? Like, he, well, yeah. they came from Blackpool, yeah. it's nearly there, yeah. isn't it? No, but I mean, but that's, that's the things you, you, you read about, and, you, and then you start to invent, or people who are in bands who are, like, I remember Blue Eve, a band called Blue. and, and uh, Oh, and, yes, Blue. Yeah, and, and lots of bands that, that were just vaguely Scottish and no more, you know. You would, I, mean, I remember I remember <laughs> found that the only ones had a Scottish bass player. I was like... Yes, and, they did, didn't yeah, they? I was did this extend yeah. to uh, to Rod Stewart? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid so. I mean, no, <laughs> fair enough. There's no shame there. <laughs> he us with all that tartan. With all that tartan. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, even things like Middle of the Road, I mean, and the Bass City Rollers, I was inordinately proud of them, you know. Like, I mean, there's some of the B sides of the Bass City Rollers and Middle of the Road records are just fantastic, you know. When they went being super pop, you know, I like super pop, but don't get me wrong. Right, right. But you, you we were talking to Midge about Marmalade. Yes. Uh, the, so, Marmalade. Oh, was, the Marmalade, as he uh, refers yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. Had to yeah. check. Had, to, had a lot of controversy because of that Gollywog thing, you know, which was. Pretty appalling, but fantastic song singer songwriters, fantastic band. I mean, the other one I really liked was Sutherland Brothers and Quiver. Oh, I've oh, yeah, yeah. I, lo- I love the Sutherland yeah. Brothers. And, and Pilot was another one we, we really made. Of course, like, yeah. of so, course. So our school jotters were just full of people who were, who, like I said, vaguely Scottish. Sorry, is that you, my? F- I'm gonna have to answer this phone now. <laughs> Don't worry. No, that's good. Like yeah, it. Marmalade were one of the, were a big international group, weren't they? For, I mean, and thus a, a source of great Scottish pride. Yeah, well, Reflections of My Life, I don't know if you know that song, one of the best songs ever. That was a huge kind of like, that was the kind of same period as, as Creedence Creel Water Revival, you know, and, and yeah. a huge hit in America and a lot to do with the Vietnam War. 
I think it's the first for it to, to mention death in it to get to number one, other than you know, leader of the pack and all those kind of kind of songs, you know. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. It wasn't yeah. a, it wasn't a terribly uh, uplifting subject, was it? No, he's, he, he, he's talking about I don't I don't want to die, you know. But I mean, which is yeah. Uh, I, I guess I must have had a lot of resonance with soldiers, obviously, you know. Yeah. Fantastic. When did you first start playing? Can you remember your first gigs? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the first gig I ever played was supporting uh, all the images at the Bungalow Bar. Oh, yeah, because they, they, they really supported you, didn't they? Lent you a lot yeah. of gear and put you on yeah, yeah. their yeah. tours. We were called uh, the Oxfam Warriors. It, it was uh, yeah. Andrew Jerry. I'm st- I still work with Johnny and Claire a lot uh, today, you know, on their different, we write songs together and work together, you know. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. So, so, sorry, I, mean, I, miss, I missed some of just that. Just talking about his band, the Oxfam Warriors, supporting uh, Altered Images, because Claire Grogan, and uh, they, they were very, very supportive of you, weren't they? They really yes. got you started. I, I, it's funny, talk about Scottish bands, I mean, it's funny, after all of us being, like, students of Scottish bands, all of a sudden we were a huge wave of Scottish bands, like maybe 40 or 50 bands got signed up at, at the same time. Yes, so that was an amazing time, wasn't it? Was it was either, either Feast or Famine, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, was <laughs> Scars, Joseph K, yeah, um, and we all, we all Orange up, Juice. We all ended up in your programme, you yes. you know? Yeah. And you were very, I mean, that was a great thing. You said, I mean, we, we were the first band on it not to be signed on the whistle test, you know, and I, and I remember... I mean, I'm going to embarrass you here, right? But we turned up, right? With with uh, it was us in the psychedelic fuzz, and we turned up with the guitars, and there was no PA there, no no sound system. And the guy goes, "Where's the sound system?" And he goes, "What do you mean?" And he goes, uh, "Yeah, what are you going to play through?" And he goes, but "It's a TV program." And he goes, "Well, you have to bring your own PA with you." <laughs> we had we had a disco and. And he actually brought flashing lights, like traffic lights. It was a kind of disco PA, and we and we played through that, right? Uh, we probably sounded like the tiniest, like you know. I remember watching the cycle of us, and they just sounded magnificent. This huge, fantastic sound, and we were like coming out a little dance set, you know, like a transistor. <laughs> well, they they were sound assigned to CBS. You no doubt paid for a big PA. Yes. It's, it's funny. It's funny till we went to London. I mean, I don't want to, I mean, we're not dumb, but we, we were so naive. It's the first time we've been on an aeroplane, first time we've been in a restaurant. I mean, we, I mean, we used to drink the finger bowls, you know, we, we could be thought, I thought it was Mrs. Soup. We used to just, like, we used to, we used to eat the relish trees. You know, everything we could, we could get for nothing. We, we used to go on planes and just sit anywhere, you know, we didn't know there was a seat in. Oh, really? Like <laughs> we didn't know, we'd, I mean, we used to go to London with not, no money. I mean, literally, not a penny, arrive off the airport, you know, and, and there's no, no one there to get us from the record company or, or what we were doing. It would be a real, we played, we played once we had a couple of hundred in, in, in uh, the National in Kilburn. We broke a bass string after two songs. We had to go off because we had no <laughs> air strings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it, the thing is, it, it was a learning curve, it, it, but also, it, any band will tell you it's the greatest period, you know, is is when it's just the, the six of you in a, in a in a van or a train, you know, with with the guitars. That's that's definitely the best period, you know. So, what did you make of that period when you were down in London? Because you got a record deal, and uh, yeah. both Dave and I were working on Smash Hits at the time. And yeah. You were constantly in Smash Hits. We always wrote about you in the gossip columns. And there was something very exciting about the Bluebells with their kind of down to earth kind of denim jacket. Uh, look, you know, kind of going clubbing with people like Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet. I mean, what was what was that like? Did those people accept you? Yeah, yeah. well, I think I mean the thing is, it, in Glasgow, it's a very um, chatting up kind of atmosphere. You, you know, if you meet a girl, you talk to her. You know, and the chat up line is "Hello, my name is," right? You know, what's your name, right? And in London, there seemed to be not that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I think I think we were just naturally charming without being. <laughs> Big heady, you know. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about all the Scottish people. You know, I used to go to Columbia. We all stayed there, but twenty bands would stay there, and we we just we had we had a confidence like that that we had no reason to have. If you get my drift, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's because we're excited to be in the in the big city. Remember, remember when we even go to places like New York, you could kind of take over New York really really quickly because people are so standoffish, and you know, and if you're super approachable and and What's the word? Um, we knew what was going on. We, we weren't idiots. I mean, we knew how to how to handle people. We knew someone was going to take, take a, you know, take the piss out of us. We would know how to handle that. We get my drift. 
but it's a, I think it's a, it's a small town thing. I mean, small city thing. Some people from Liverpool. I mean, you think about the Beatles. The biggest thing that I remember reading in all the books you do about the Beatles is their charm. How even George Absolutely. Martin find them yeah. because they they were char- And then I remember when we went to to meet a veil for the first time. People like Kid Jensen and all they they really took us because we were just. Charming, I guess, is the word, you know what I mean? No, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, well, it's just, it's being friendly, isn't it? Because, yeah. And when you meet bands, particularly young bands, is they put on a front of being really cool. Yes. When underneath, you know they're really excited. Yeah. But they just don't want to admit it. And also so, insecure as well. It's, yes. a, it's a form of insecurity, isn't it? That kind of uh, standoff. Yeah. You, well, know. You, you must have been at Top to Top. So Top to Top, every time we went there, we had the best fun. And then you look down the other bands on the little stages, looking like they wish they were, they were anywhere else. <laughs> So who, who were you on Top of the Pops with? Can you remember? Well, New Order and people like that. Oh, and, right, right. And the first time I went to Top of the Pops actually was with, with, with Shaboli, with Anna Rama. And it was, uh, they were doing Shy Boy, I think it was, and it was Shalimar. Remember, I remember, was, they were great. They, they were super excited too. I tell you, Brian and Rama were exactly like us. I mean, Brian and Rama yeah. were just the greatest people to be around. We used to go to this place called San Maritz in, in, uh, in, in Soho. And they, they did this thing called Gimpy Dancing. And, and what the DJ, I think it was a guy called Fat Tony, they played Chippy Chippy Cheat Cheat or Slid of My Father. And people just danced like idiots, you know, falling on the floor. There was no coolness about it at all. And all, I mean, people would just be laughing their head off, like tear, Paul Simper and all that people like that there. I mean, because it was just, there was no effort. It wasn't like going to the beat route or a mud club. Do you know what I mean? You know, which would have been intensely self-conscious and uh, oh, for me it was uh, uh, exactly yeah, yeah, it was, it, 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 gimpy was, dancing. I love that. Well, yeah, gimpy, da- yeah. But I mean, in, in the mud club, it's like I'm wearing a duffel coat and cord trousers, you know, and, and like you, you're the weirdo, you know, you're the one that stands out because you haven't got a Robin Hood suit on, you know, you haven't yeah. got, you're not dressed like Louis the Fourteenth, you know. So, but I, I really, but people, people were, those people were fantastic people too, you know. They really, I mean, all Siobhan's friends. We're, I mean, I'm from Glasgow, right? I, and I, I moved in a day after I met her, probably, right? And they all, they all took took to me, you know, right away. You know, it was it was it was a, not really like. I mean, even though I look like I look very geeky for a girl that you on, you know, but but it was all all worked out good. Do you think I mean, it, it, a really key decision you obviously took very early on was to call yourself Bobby Bluebell? Well, that was Edwin Collins, isn't it? You know, was it? It was yeah. his idea, was it? Yeah, he, he sang a piece like, you know, Bobby Blue Bill on my knee, you know. Oh, yes. I think it was something like there's no one, no one more tree or something like that, man, you know. There's some, but uh, I think it's kind of looked a bit like Joey Ramone, so it's going to be always going to happen along those lines, you know. I never, I never picked Bobby Blue Bill, but I tell Why you. Why did you decide to do that? I, I didn't decide, it just became. It, it, People that you started doing it, you know, like yeah. the bluebells. I think it's true. But I tell you what, what it's it's a lot of power in, in the name which I've which I've discovered as, as I've come on. Right, you know, it's like everyone is it. It's like it. it I mean, it's a great thing. And I, I, I used to it used to be really embarrassed about it, you know, like. But now, you know, my daughter's university. She's twenty two, right? And and St Andrews, and all the friends. You, you're Bobby, you know, it's Bobby Bluebell, right? And there's no, there's no irony to it. There's just a, they think it's your real name, you know? But he, he, you see, you're twice as famous because you were called Bobby Bluebell. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's as great, simple as that. Yeah. You know, I, I, can can remember, I, can the, <laughs> I can remember the days, you know, you, you, you'd always write about Bobby Bluebell in Smash Hits because it was yeah. Bobby Bluebell. Yeah, and also because I was out everywhere. At yeah, the, I suppose we, so. <laughs> I, 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 we both did the little gossip columns and, and smash it. And every fortnight, there was you. Yeah. You're always with Siobhan Fay of Vernon's falling out of a taxi. Yes, <laughs> having having had too much fizzy pop. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were great times. And having a snog up. <laughs> yeah. Well, years later, I ended up working with her husband, uh, Dave Stewart, and. You know, Dave, Dave would take you around the world, you know, he was my publisher. And it, it's funny when you're meeting people like uh, Quincy Joneses and Tom Petty's and you're Bobby Bluebell and they think you're somebody because you're called Bobby oh, Bluebell. Yeah, Bluebell. absolutely. You know, right? Like, you know, right? Like, like they assume they must know who, who you are, you know. And they haven't got the foggiest, of course, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so 
tell us, remind us the story of Young at Heart. At Heart, yeah. That first appeared in the 80s, didn't it? Yeah, well, it first appeared on uh, Deep Sea Sky. When it was, it was, at that it was time, a Bananarama record first, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It? And, and, you, and she co-wrote it with you, I think, Siobhan. Yes, we, we, we were in the house, uh, like we spent most of the day with the blinds down watching TV, you know. Till, till night time came along, and then uh, we were watching uh, that film Young at Heart in, by uh, Frank Sinatra. And I was saying to him, that's my dad's favourite film, you know. And then uh, we just had to talk about our parents. We had, you know, uh, Siobhan had a very um, fractured, moving around kind of childhood, you know, and she was a very independent girl, you know, and I was just becoming independent. So we just wrote about, you know, uh, missing your, how you take your parents for granted, you know, and that's what it's about, really, and how come I love them now, I come I love them more when all I wanted to do when I was old was to walk out the door, you know? And and then, you know, I think well, when you become a parent, you really value your parents, you know? I think, I think I think the time, at that time we were all, I was always thinking, I'm going to write a song with another t- a title that's already been used because I might get the PRS money from that song, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Genius! So, yeah, and then it happened once with Stevie Wonder, happy, happy, I have to give it all back, but happy birthday, happy birthday. But, um, oh, but, good, did he? Yeah, 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 that would make <laughs> sense. Go on. Yeah. They're too clever now, Peter, it's all computerised. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so they, they did, I wanted, I wanted to get a, she all wanted to write a song, she'd written one song, I think, called uh, Give Us Back Our Cheap Fares, which is a oh, beat. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah. then uh, she wanted to write songs for Brian because they were, Jolly and Swain. So Jolly and Swain took that song and, and then I think they turned it into a really kind of turgidy kind of like uh, digital, not a very good track. You know, I, I always thought the song was really good. And then I used to always think, well, we, we were doing it live anyway, Bluebells, it was kind of Northern Soul. We I mean, did it on Switch actually, in a really big Northern Soul with brass and all that. And Roger Ames was, was wanting us to record it ourselves as a single. And I was thinking, well, it's too, even our version, it's too like Bananarama's version, even though I thought it was a better, better thing. So um, I started messing around with them, um, with uh, I, I, I Want You, I, I listened to a lot to I Want You by Bob Dylan and had that kind of shuffle, you know, which you can probably hear already as, as part of Young Heart, you can always sing it over it, you know what I mean? And then uh, and then we were friends with uh, Dexies and we wanted that girl Helen O'Hara to play the violin on it, you wanted to kind of like, at that time too, it was the higher, you know, of Bob Dylan tracks yeah. as well. And, and obviously Dexys had uh, come on Eileen. And Roger was just saying that um, he didn't want her to play it because it would just be too much. He had Dexys on his label too, you know. So we ended up using uh, uh, a Bobby Valentino to play the violin on it. And then, and then uh, it became a big hit. It became a bigger hit the second time because of, it was an advert, you know. This is well, let's tell us the story of that because, again, wasn't that Kate... Yeah, Claire, Claire, Claire Grogan's sister. Yeah, serendipity. They yeah. wanted. I think they wanted. Uh, I will always love you, but they couldn't afford it. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, they're going to use. They're going to use Dolly Parton doing it, and then uh, they made. I think they made the advert, and obviously Whitney Houston had made it into the, this massive hit. So the money went up from like yeah. a million, a quarter of a million pounds. They wanted just to use Dolly Parton's track. She could ask for anything she wanted, obviously. So uh, they they were they were they were sort of stymied, and and then. Uh, Kate, who's Claire's sister, who's, who's who was called Catherine as well, you know, she she uh, suggested she said she said young heart would fit over that. It's got the same the same the, the, the same kind of sentiment, you know, you know of of the song. So they tried it and it apparently it worked right away. So they made us an offer on it, really cheap offer, which we obviously we're going to take right away, you know. <laughs> I think the thing is that I know people think it's the advert, right? But what really made it was radio play. There was six hundred songs that year as adverts, and only one of them was a hit, which was ours. You really? Know? Yeah. And, and I remember too. I remember, you, you know, we were all brought up Catholics, right? And I remember there was a big thing in the papers about, especially in abroad, about the Pope condemning that advert because it promoted divorce, you know, right? So I thought that was a really great thing, you know, like if you'd only known that it was two complete utter Catholics who'd written this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It promoted so, divorce? Yeah, he said the advert made a divorce attractive and it was because you see the girl celebrating her divorce, you know, and she's oh, yeah. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just divorced in it, you know? 
So, it, but it was number one, wasn't it? Number one, yeah, for, for a good few weeks. That was a great time. And, and that was in the days when a number one was a number one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. I, me- I remember that in those days there was no mobile phones, and I was down in the Rovers in our local high street, Myers Road, it's called. And they, I was in the queue, I think I was just buying bulbs. And there was a big queue, right? and I was looking down the queue, and I saw the guy in front was holding young at heart, right? And I looked past him, and the next person was, was holding it. And they were all holding it. And I remember rushing out to the phone box to phone up Ken and go, Ken, everyone in Robles has got young at heart. It's going to be a hit. And, and, and then we just, and then when it into the charts number five, it was a real, really good, I mean, it's like winning the cup for, for a band, you know, it was like, it was, it was really exciting, you know, because we, we weren't in a group together anymore, I was DJing, and Ken and David were doing their own thing, so it was just a really exciting time. Right, right. But now You're still you... earning from it now, presumably. Yeah, I, <laughs> since this great <guy>, publicly. <laughs> yeah. I'm not paying any taxes on this at all, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it actually does really, really well. Man. It's, it still gets a lot of play. All these 80s stations and compilation albums, you know, like... And, this is and, it. it's, and, the, it's the amount... I, I was told this by somebody at one of the collection agencies, that if you had a hit, you know, 30, 40 years yeah. ago, you're sort of making more money from it now yeah. than you did then because there's far more media. It is. There's a millions of radio stations and they're all paying. One yeah, way also, you, you just, back then you would get good money from a record sale, right, and good money from radio play. Now you get a penny or half P, right? But there's yeah. lots and lots of half P's and pennies out there. This is it. You know, like, so... So it's like, remember that film, Superman film, where, where, where the, the guy collects, takes away all the fractions of, of dollars and puts them in his own account? Yeah, and yeah. Two billion pounds in his account. It's a bit, it's a bit like that for people now. In, in this, I mean, it's funny. People want, people want catalogs, and they want, they want hedge funds. They want, a, they want a catalog that's got another one in it. I, I, to be fair, I've had a, few, a lot of hits for other bands that I've written. You know, so the catalog thing is is good. You know, but at the same time, too, you kind of want to keep all the your own songs, you know. Yeah, right. So the Bluebells, I mean, you you are kind of active now. Yeah. You've just made an album, is that? Yes, it? It, it's called the. Uh, I've got the test press somewhere. It's called Bluebells in the Twenty First Century. Yeah, that's the one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, this is it, the the test press and a good white picture for your image there. You know. Right. But, uh, <laughs> it's, do you it's, still it's, tour? I mean, you had a reunion at one point, but do you still do you still tour? No, you are, well, we just played at the weekend there for Celtic Connection, a sold out concert at Oran Moor. And the first time, I mean, it's like, what, what it is, is like, there's a new label in Glasgow called Last Night from Glasgow, like it's an independent label, and it does vi- mostly vinyl. And it's got us like the trash cans, hips way. So what, it, what it's done is given us a whole new lease of life. All the records sell out, you know, we do gigs. The, the guy who runs it is a really good guy, man. And so... We've got an outlet, do you know what I mean? And, and having a, a real physical thing is very attractive for a, for a band like us, you know? So it just, it, it's just, and also recording is, a, is the greatest process of all, you know, for a band, you know, it, it, like to, to make a record is a great thing, you know, with your friends. So it's all been good. So you, you're doing gigs nowadays. Uh-huh. And you must be doing gigs alongside people that you used to play alongside when you were like 18 or 19. Yeah, yeah. There used to be, for a while we were doing some of those rewind things where it was like Top of the Pops backstage, you know, it'd be hot chocolate, you know, and, and Frankie Goes to Hollywood and Spandau. And they're great laughs, actually. I mean, you ever seen that that, that programme? I think it's kind of, was it Star Street or something? It's called without everybody's famous in the street. Oh, right. oh, Stella, Stella Street. Street. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you're walking, you're, you walk down the restroom and it's like, all hi, hi, hi. China <laughs> crisis. <laughs> Human League. Howard Jones. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, Nick, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, and, and it, 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 it's quite funny. I the thing is, to me, they all look, I mean, the best one to me is people like Captain Sensible, who's just a fantastic guy, man, right? You know, they all are, you know, but they all look exactly the same, you know what I mean? But only... These so only these are 80s packages, uh, really, aren't yeah, they? You yeah, just go yeah. on and do two or three songs. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't do them anymore, but for a while, the money's so good, I, and you, like I said, you want to do these, sometimes you just want to see people, you know? Yeah. And, and it, but 
it is a, it is a phenomenon I never thought would happen. I used to see those things on television at Wembley, the rock and roll. Yeah, know, yeah, the, the enemy uh, pole winners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and exactly think, the same. Yeah, and, and you think, wow, that's... Except that, it's that, Nick that. Kershaw and... Uh, yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> Howard Jones, you know what I mean? Howard like, Jones, fantastic. But, yeah, so I, I guess it's... That's actually why I wanted to call us in the 21st century. It's like, I'm quite happy to be this age. I'm quite happy to be alive, to tell you the truth. You know, and we don't... We, we, we just want to say goodbye to that kind of like where you're just playing songs. I mean, it, must, it, it, it is a good thing and a bad thing where you're playing songs. I mean, Claire's just did a new album, you know. It's like she had to do it. You can't just play your old songs all the time. Yeah, you, you have to feel like you're, you're, you're making some sort of progress, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. So are you you're touring? No, well, the thing is, we all... All the boys work, you know. They they are they're all professors at music college. The whole ba- my whole band, all of them, Ken, David, Mike, Mike, sorry, uh, Douglas, and Campbell are all professors of music in Glasgow. Oh, one Pro- of you professors. went off and joined the Guardian, didn't you? As a golf correspondent, was it Lawrence? That was Lawrence, yeah. For he Jonathan, he one became one a, a Guardian golf correspondent. I remember that. Well, he's, he's not anymore. He's he, he's an author now. You know, he writes yeah. uh, he writes books. Yeah. He's a shady guy. <laughs> <laughs> but so, sorry, you, you're all, they're all professors of music. They all yeah. teach. Yes. It's astonishing, isn't it? I mean, Glasgow's probably got more music colleges. The thing is, than any place in, 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 in Britain. And then is, we all, none of us were taught music. Isn't that strange? You know, I mean, yeah. even, even poor Alan Rankin, who from the Associates died recently, he was professor of music. At the same college, you know what I mean, as, as Ken's professional music at. So uh, it, it just seems to be a thing that everybody drifts into, you know. Well, so when we were talking there, is it David, what is it, David Scott of the Pearl Fishers? Yeah, yeah. He, he, you know, when you're in. He's another <laughs> one, isn't he? Yeah. I'd never thought of this. Yeah. All, all Scottish musicians end up being Scottish music professors. Yes, that's yeah. why you'll find the whole of postcard records now, simply, <laughs> in well, education. Well, it, I try to think. It, no, I don't think any of them are actually. I think Stephen's in New York. James was a chiropodist for a while. I just saw him the other day. He, we did a concert together for. Um, I can just show you this book. This is um, the story of uh, the Scottish music scene. All right. Hungry Beat. And um, we did a big concert at the weekend. All, all the different bands like Fire Engines and uh, Orange Juice, I had a the camera. Um, Particularly Boom Boom, uh, James King, Lone Wolves. It was, and uh, so we just did a, it was a, a kind of like a celebration concert. Right. You know, like, it was like a, a soul review, you know what I mean, with the, with the band never left the stage. Oh, yeah. we just. But, but, but the four tops came on, and then the Temptations. <laughs> only, it, only it was the Blue Girls came on, and then I took Cap. I mean, like, it was like a, like a, 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 it was actually a great fun, you know. What so, a hood. The Good in London, it was, yeah. It was like, it was, it was like Woodstock, it was like four hours long. <laughs> Oh, that, that's Fantastic. brilliant. Uh, well, look, Bobby, it's been lovely to talk to you. No problem. The way, the way we traditionally finish these things, I don't know if you can answer this question, yeah. is, is we ask people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made. Ah, uh, well, uh, I, I, this is my greatest record I've ever made only because I think that without this, none of us would be in the place we are. And it's uh, Blue Boy by Orange Juice. I did this, we all cover these sleeves in. One week, one week in postcard records, about ten of us. We all hand covered the sleeves. The other side is Joseph K. But um, we, this was the one that uh, I think put Glasgow on the map. And also, it's right. really exciting records, you know. For me, it changed everything. It, it made me want to be in a band rather than be a writer, you know. So you all sat there with those sleeves and, and actually coloured those in. Yeah. How, how many? How many records? Would you have done? I would say a thousand. So, some of them they, they were unusable because they were covered in slot stickers and things like that. And like, you know, obviously, because we got drunk or, you know, like, <laughs> did more things. But I like this one. I kept this one because um, I, I kept a couple and I kept a few blank sleeves. But I like this one just because I like the idea of them as being guardsmen, you know. But they, they, or just for a great band. And, and I think that they, 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 what they led us all into can't be underestimated, to tell you the truth, you know. No, sure. Well, look, thanks very much for talking to us. Fantastic to talk to you.